Hi there, my name is David Garrido and you are listening to Highbury and Heels. Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Highbury and Heels. We hope you've been enjoying your football. Uh, we certainly have and haven't. Kind of a half and half, but that, that goes with the uh, turf being an Arsenal fan. Joining me today on the show is Sophia. Hey Sophia, how are you doing? Hey Sophie, I'm very well, thank you. Gutted I missed the last step, but you know, I'm back with a bang and ready to go. Yeah, we're not uh, Amanda and Seema uh, aren't on the show, but you'll be hearing from them a little bit later on. Who we do have on the show today is one of my favorite men in broadcasting. I interviewed him years ago on an old show here in Los Angeles. He's a Colombiano Brit. He's a lifelong Sheffield Wednesday fan. He's over 15 years in broadcasting, although I'm not trying to age him. I'm just trying to show <laughs> that he has prow- prowess and pedigree. An Oxford undergraduate. Um, he worked for the BBC. He's presented Final Score, Football Focus, Match of the Day, the Football League show. He joined Sky Sports in 2011. He is the voice of La Liga for Sky Sports, but he's also covered Wimbledon, the World Cup, Formula One, the Champions League final in his career. Welcome to the show, Mr. David Garrido. My goodness. Sophie, what a build up. I, I don't know how I'm going to do this justice. I really don't. But yeah, you pretty much encapsulated my career in 60 seconds there. I mean, do you want, do you want me to say anything else? Is that, is that me done? No, you're done. You're yeah, out. Can I go now? That's, or? that's exactly what Gary Lineker said. He's like, right, I'm out. That's me done. <laughs> Oh, no. Thanks for joining us, um, David. Thank we you. love your stuff. No, t- uh, no worries. No worries. Absolutely. Pleasure. As you say, it's been a long time, Sophie. So, you it know, has. Uh, it's, it's, it's long. long overdue. Yeah. Well, listen, let's get stuck in. Thanks for joining us at Talking Little Arsenal and, and uh, among uh, other stuff we're going to sure. touch on today. I just wanted to, to start off, even though the game was uh, just over a week ago, just because the juxtaposition of Arsenal sometimes is kind of insane. We saw the good, the bad and the ugly of them in the last couple of weeks. And that Swansea sure. game. Um, just absolutely sucked. And then we go into the Everton game and then we can rewind to the Crystal Palace game. And, yep. you know, we Arsenal fans don't quite know what we're going to get. How do you explain <laughs> the Swansea performance and then going into the Everton performance when you see both teams really as poor as each other they've been this season, haven't they, the Swans and, and the Toffees? Mm, yeah. Do you know what? I, I'm quite good friends with Carlos Carvalho, who's the Swansea manager, because he used to be a Wednesday manager, of course. And um, since he's moved to the Liberal Stadium. We've, we've been in touch. Um, he did have a very specific game plan for that game, which was executed to perfection. But I think it's, it's a really strange thing. You can sort of explain it a little bit home and away. I think, you know, you go to Bournemouth, you go to, to Swansea and they just for some reason didn't have the same intensity. And I know that, you know, Arsenal had this long winning run at home in the Premier League for a while and then they lost it, but they seem to have rediscovered that mojo at the Emirates. Whereas Swansea, I think it was a really well applied game plan. I think when teams don't just sort of sit and let you have the ball, but they have a specific strategy that's employed for very specific reasons and trying to eliminate one person, trying to do something else. And, and you know, Carlos actually privately, you know, can, can tell me a little bit about this. Mm. Then you, you find that actually, you know, Arsenal sometimes don't quite have the answers. Um, I think, you know, there's just been there's always a lot of noise around the club. And I think that in itself is distracting, um, whether it's to do with uh, Arsene Wenger, whether it's to do with signings and sales. Uh, whether it's to do with these kind of performances, there's, there's always some sort of level of drama. And I personally don't think that helps. I think, you know, when has it ever been a quiet period of Arsenal? <laughs> when we were, winning, th- when I mean, we were probably, winning things. <laughs> well, yeah, maybe maybe that was, that. maybe, yeah. I mean, listen, I think, um, look, n- no one's discounting three FA Cups in four years. I certainly don't. I think that, you know, the, the, the history books will, will do the talking on that. And, you know, uh, I know a lot of people pride finishing in the top four, etc. And that's been part of Wenger's argument as well. But ultimately, there was that long spell without trophies. Mm. And that finally got that got changed with that, with that first FA Cup of the three. So I, I do think that, you know, the, the success is starting to return. But there's always a reason to, 
to try and attack the club and and i just kind of feel that a little bit of you know now that the window is over um that <laughs> oh, got a like, good result against everton i think that now is sort of the fuck oh look you've got the derby coming up haven't you so oh, i think God. that might be more noise but <laughs> and, and city and city don't forget but look i think um i think that what would help is you know just a little bit of perspective in these things the thing is that obviously the views on people like arsene wenger have are, are polarized the club you know and um it's, it's it's in a way i just kind of feel that it would be useful for everyone concerned if it was just a sort of a period of quiet and just to focus now on what you've got with a ba- Bamiyang who's come in with, you know, a, a, a group of players that has changed. And Wenger, I think, feels happy with the business done, you know, mm. three in, five out. I think that actually he himself is happy with the business done. So let's see how these players perform now um, and see if Mkhitaryan and Aubameyang in particular can, can make can make a difference. Um, and I personally think, you know what, you've got some real striking options now my goodness um and and this guy has proved it everywhere he's been so you know maybe this is the time when things start sorting themselves out um david i just want to circle back to something you just said about Mm. um the fans um all the noise around the club and that you don't think it's good for us and you think it's reflecting on the pitch etc and one of the things that we've been talking about uh especially last week um on the pod um john cross actually did a tweet saying that uh, he thinks that the way our ex-players and legends are treated by our Arsenal fans is worse than any other fans with their clubs. Would you agree right. with that? Um, what, what do I you don't think? Know. Well, I listen, John is closer to Arsenal than I am, so I have to sort of maybe um, defer to him a little bit on this point. But look, I, I mean, I, speaking to a couple of them that we've we've seen um, at Sky uh, and, and Robbie Perez, um, I've got to know through La Liga stuff as well and, and other projects outside Sky. But he he seems to be, you know, one of those most well loved players. I think yeah. you know people always seem to you know speak warmly about him um, with this real nice kind of reminiscing quality. You know, you just sort of remember those that those halcyon days of the earth early 2000s and, and and when he was you know just an automatic choice and not just the goals but the style the mm-hmm. you know the, the way that he owned you know the, the pitch at times and i think that robbie is one who, who i don't think he's spoken about badly uh, and thierry i don't think particularly either but i don't know if that applies to other legends that that haven't you know got that sort of close connection to the club remember obviously both of them french speakers and maybe have more reason to be still in touch with arsenal banger robbie is is training with arsenal as well keeping fit with them thierry has had a connection with them obviously through through youth systems and then obviously working with with the belgian national team is going to give, give him a little bit of context and, and grounding to be able to go and work with roberto martinez so those are the only two examples that i can have but, but listen if, if if john is saying that there's been other sort of treatment of, of other legends and that isn't a particular I, I think one of the things that is key about this is that you know when you've had that 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 time when you've been one of the top teams in the country you're part of that huge rivalry with Manchester United the the, the doubles etc I personally think that you know you need to kind of um, harness that in a different way afterwards it's not just that moment then it's about trying to use that in the future Mm -hmm. Um, and some clubs have been very good at actually you know taking that forward and making those people still feel wanted and part of the club and then maybe using their talents in a coaching environment, in an ambassadorial role. Um, so I think maybe, you know, if there is work to do for Arsenal on that front, then then it can only be a good thing that they can they can, they can progress in that, that way. See, I think the reason why the likes of uh, uh, Perez and Henri don't get as much stick from fans is because they're less outspoken against Arsenal. I 100%. think I think the ones like uh, Lee, um, Ian Wright, who I know is really annoyed about the abuse he's been getting to the point where he actually left Twitter and Lee Dixon, you know, it's like you can't say anything against Arsenal and and if you do, then how can you call yourself a legend? Why are you still, you know, you're a disgrace, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, I've seen, you know, some of the abuse they get when you look at their timelines. It's the, I mean, even to the point where Henri made a point of when when Alexis moved and said I spoke to Henri and then Henri got so much abuse that he had to mm. go and tweet and say I never spoke to Alexis I never told him to leave it's it's it's, it's got in like it's that bad and I just I think you know what I, th- I think just to come in on that point I think that might be maybe a slight mm, something to do with the the forum the the actual interface if you like by which people are actually interacting with the story and i think one of the bad things about twitter is it's very easy to take things out of context yeah and people are con- constantly 
criticizing or justifying you know it's, it's always attacking or defending and you know my, while that might work for football i think that you know you've got to be very careful on on social media yeah and you know i think that it's such an easy that we're, we're talking just generally about social media and, and and what it's sort of pluses and minuses are and of course the interaction is a good thing but I think Twitter in particular can be such a harsh environment, can be yeah. a place where people are. Mm -hmm. And look, we've all experienced this, right? You know, whether you're yeah. male, female, yeah. black, oh. white, yeah. green, purple, whatever, right? You you at some point are going to get slack. Uh, sorry, you're going to get um, some, some stick from people uh, who are from the same football club as you. I can experience, I can say this from my own perspective as a Wednesday fan, you know, when we didn't go up last season, things started to turn. Our own set of fans, our own fan base became very negative. And mm -hmm. I suddenly became a happy clapper. And, you know, because I'm generally a positive person. <laughs> oh, and you're God. there going, geez, man, you need to go and relax and, yeah. you know, just, just have a drink and just Chill. work out what's, what's important in life, right? Cause, yeah. you know, if you spend your life on this, on this platform slagging people off, then frankly, you know, you need to look at the mirror. I, think, I, I, I just think that, you know, that maybe that story regarding Henri and Alexis exploded more because of the nature of which it was discussed. Yeah. I think that that's p part of the problem here. You have to ask yourself, would people actually say that to Thierry Henry to his face? Well, exactly. They, 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 exactly. Ab they, they absolutely wouldn't. And we've actually right. also seen it with, um, you know, Man United fans and Paul Scholes because he's been very critical. Again, just doing his job, he's paid to do his job, but that doesn't diminish what he did for the club and the kind of ambassador he's been for the club over the years. I just want to circle back to the Everton game real quick, mm. David. Before we move on, yeah, sure. Um, you know, it for us, we we often sit and we were talking about this yesterday and saying, you know, you mentioned it too. With now, I think our attacking force has more of a balance. Uh, as much as we all love Sanchez, and I don't think anybody really wanted him to leave, but when he did make it clear he wanted to leave, everyone agreed that it was best that he did move on. But I feel like the additions um, have balanced the team much, much more. And the one thing that we just don't get is why can't we find the same balance in um, defense and also kind of in that defensive midfield midfield role? You yeah. know, you, you close to managers and you talk to them a lot too. Why can't Wenger see what we all see with our defensive deficiencies why didn't we go buy a defender in the january transfer market why didn't we do well that? maybe he does see it but maybe he doesn't value it as much as we do and oh, i think yeah. everyone has said you know mm. you've never replaced Vieira, um and whether it's you know granite Xhaka or whoever it is who's you know i suppose cochlear whoever it was that was playing in that role to try and hold things together in midfield they were never ever going to measure up to that um maybe he just feels very very wedded to his philosophy um in other words stubborn and i, I personally think that's still where you need to, to strengthen and i think loads of people still do uh, it's always been that spine and when you think about when when arsenal were you know the team who who were not only just playing brilliant football but were winning league titles that spine was as solid as anything and not just solid but but excelled in every single element of each of their roles now you can't say the same i'd say that at the back uh, well, sorry, as, as a keeper, I think you know, you know Petr Cech is the best that you can get at this point in terms of the the, the budget that you guys seem to put to players, etc. You know, you can't buy the hair, you can't buy Courtois, etc., uh, etc. Et and even though you sell to other clubs, you don't seem to buy from other clubs no. uh, in the Premier <laughs> League. Um, the, the defense is a real issue for me. Um, I just, it is for us I just as have well. never really believed. I've never really believed in Mustafi. I thought that they over paid for him ah. uh, Valencia is a team that I follow closely in La Liga and I just thought you know there's there's a, look, there's, there's a lot of, of, of Jorge Mendes going on there but even so <laughs> you pay what you pay for the player what you think that player is worth and he was not worth north of £30,000 um, David do you think he's regressed do you think he's regressed since coming from Valencia well, I mean I you said he's... you didn't really see that he was great so so we definitely yeah. 35 million we paid for him didn't we yeah he was, he was never worth that um, How much I, would you I, have I think paid? that he was 20. <laughs> really? 20 of that. Wow. Of that. Yeah. Think. yeah. But, but listen, yeah. this is, this is where it gets into agents and valuations of players and mm -hmm. all that kind of very murky underworld <laughs> that, that operates in football. I don't think he's regressed. I don't think he's, uh, shot up. I don't think he's developed. I think he's actually oscillated. And, you know, there are times wow. when you sort of go, oh, well, okay. Yeah. I see what this guy's about. Uh, cause Shani different, different, you know, level of player for me but you know if, if that's what you're going with at, at, at centre-back and you've got Mertesacker 
and then you know he's he's not getting any younger i just sort of felt like you know that there was there was a chance you know in previous windows to bring in that player and there were always those names linked mm-hmm. but it's never been done and then of course what did you do go late for johnny evans well yeah. look, you know oh, there's where's the strategy where's the strategy there <laughs> there is none um, that that was a bit that was a bit dodgy i guess that um you know for us as well monreal has become quite the player um mm. And, you know, we feel like he makes up for some of our defensive deficiencies because he has more of that that leadership, um, even more than Koscielny uh, these days. And, we, you know, we're fearing that he might be injured for the North London derby. And, and I, I especially feel like without Monreal at the back, I, I kind of I don't fear us going forward in the North London derby, but I certainly fear us at the back um, without Monreal. Do you think he's become a pivotal player for Arsenal yeah. too? Yeah, I think I think both, and I think actually, you know, Bayer in a couple of seasons ago and last season was was the player that was being linked constantly with with Barcelona. So yeah, I mean, I think that actually, you know, your your fullbacks were part of the kind of evolution of Arsenal that I I was thinking, oh, they they do anything here? It's it's because of this kind of player. Uh, I do really think that Monreal having come back uh, is a big miss for the derby. Listen, I think actually Kalasnak has done well. I, I I like him. I think that he's you know he's he's got a little bit about. Sort of ben- Benjamin Mondi about him. He's strong. He will go and create and bustle and just create a little bit of havoc uh, from maybe a little bit where you least expect it. So why do you think Arsene isn't playing it? Because I, I, I too love Kalasinak and I just don't understand why it's not getting played. Because I think that Kalasinak for me works as a as a wing back, as a wing more back, more than as right, a full back. Right. Mm-hmm. And if you're playing Koscielny and Mustafi as centre backs and not a third centre back with you know someone like Callum Chambers or whatever, yeah, then I think that you you need that extra insurance behind Kalasinak when he bombs forward, okay, to play him. Right. And that actually, Monreal sense. is more of a, an, a you know like a Monreal is a, a little bit like a a, a budget Jordi Alba if you like. <laughs> he's he's a good <laughs> left back. <laughs> But listen, Jordi Alba is a cracking footballer. Yeah, he is. He a is. A cracking yes, footballer. If you look at just the stats between him and Messi and the amount that they combine, not just the one way, but Messi will often look for that for that diagonal ball to, to bring Jordi Alba into the open space. He is an excellent attacking left back, but also he defends. Right. And I think that that's the thing is that you've got that real balance and that's what you need. I know that modern fullbacks are different. They always bomb forward, etc. But if they if they don't defend... Then you need that that extra insurance behind, and if they do, well, okay, you've got almost the perfect fullback there. Um, and I think actually, listen, you experimented with the with the three at the back, and it worked for a while. But mm-hmm. now you've got to try and find a way of accommodating, you know, more, more people. Your your injuries have cleared up, so you know you need to try and be able to, to fit in. You know, you had you had Wilshire on the bench mm-hmm. against Everton. You had Lacazette on the bench against Everton. Uh, remember that Wenger won't necessarily play two up front, so no. you need to try and remove that extra defender and put it into the midfield where you do have a lot of options. So three at the back, I think, therefore, for me, feels a little bit, you know, a little bit unnecessary uh, on occasion. But I just think that, and it's nice to be able to play in different systems, and I think that's part of football as being supposedly, you know, intelligent football brains is the, you know, the phrase that I hear often. Well, okay, if they are that intelligent with football brains, then they should be able to adapt to any system. Yeah, but I are. think actually, yeah. for me, uh, a, a, a four-two-three-one is the way to go with Arsenal. I like someone like a Ramsey or a Wilshire there alongside a holder, or maybe sometimes you won't need that. Sometimes actually the quality of the players you've got compared to your opposition means you don't need that holder and then you can go and play. But if that is the case, then you've got to make sure you're solid down the flanks. And that's where I think Monreal is so key. Yeah. And I, I do, I think it is a real interesting kind of talking point ahead of the derby, because then if Spurs decide to sort of uh, double up on that side, for example, or, you know, definitely let, let their fullbacks have a crack at, you know, at Kalasanash because they know that he is more, vulnerable behind his own space then you know then then i think that could be a real kind of key jewel as far as the north london derby is concerned so speaking of you was talking about our defense i want to talk about up front and the new boys what what did you make of mkhitaryan and abang mayang in the everton game listen i think um it was slightly forced upon wenger about mkhitaryan uh, ultimately, I think he doesn't feel like he's done the worst business, but it was Sanchez's decision. This is ultimately what, what led this led, led us to this situation. When else would you swap um, a player, not just with another Premier League team, but with another Premier League team with whom the manager you just do not get on at all? Mm. Um, you know, when would you ever do business with Manchester United if Jose Mourinho was their manager and you're Arsene Wenger? <laughs> and, and also, you know, <laughs> Mkhitaryan is... I, I actually really like him as a player. I think he's a very intelligent player. I think actually he goes about 
his own business relatively quietly, but will always sort of make a, a bit of a telling impact. And I think it's balance for me. That's what Arsenal's, you know, uh, attacking talents need is a bit of balance. And he's the sort of player that I think has the intelligence to, to sit in those spaces when everyone else is attacking that he's maybe done his bit in the move, but then he's anticipating the counter mm. and knows that Arsenal have thrown everyone forward. He will be that player who, who stops and thinks for a moment. And I think I, I really like him as a signing, but I do think that it was forced upon Wenger because Sanchez wanted to go. And of course he was going to go. Aubameyang, uh, listen, 60 million for a 28 year old. Sounds like a lot of money, but he, as I said, he's done it before everywhere he's gone. Yeah. I think what's interesting here is maybe the, the dynamic between the strikers because you've paid a similar amount of money for Lacazette. And mm -hmm. both of them want to be number one. And if you don't play them together, then there might be a situation where one of them is not going to be happy. With Giroud, yeah. you didn't have that so much. And Walcott just had to deal with it, um, <laughs> even though he got <laughs> for a half a season about it. But but not not on the same level. So you no. know you can just simply have that argument with Theo and say, listen, you know these guys are worth what they're worth because they are as good as they are. And this is why Walcott goes for twenty, and you know, and 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 you sign a Bamiyang for three times as much. Yeah, and they're, they're essentially, you know, the same age. Um, we, but, you know, I think I, I, I like I like the signing. I like the signing. It shows ambition. You know, if you think about how Arsene Wenger and how Arsenal generally used to be in the transfer market, you know, I think the first time they laid out some money was Jose Antonio Reyes. Do you remember that? Mm. Long yes. time ago. I, I remember going him. to the Emirates. Or going, I well, actually, it was, at, it was at Highbury. I was going to Highbury just to cover the story for Radio 1 and going, wow, what a big, what a big amount of money this is. But then, the, you know, it felt like he had his fingers burnt from that. And just was shying away from that. Never ever really spent money. But then it's changed with Özil, with 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 uh, Aubameyang, with Lacazette. Now the money is is you know the money that Arsenal should be spending to attract players. Um, I think the other thing about Mkhitaryan, by the way, is that he wants to play for the club. You know, this is a club he's wanted to play for, and therefore I think you're going to get more buy-in from a player like this. So that's why I don't think it's such a bit of bad business. Yeah. And maybe that's how Wenger has kind of calculated it and gone, okay, well I wouldn't ideally do this, but Sanchez is going to run down his contract otherwise. I've got to go with these guys because he's going to get paid by by United. I get Mkhitaryan back. Okay, well, do you know what? That's not too bad. And I think ultimately it, it hasn't checked out. Even though if you consider the values of those two players. Sanchez is obviously worth more, but mm. the fact that it was a straight swap deal and they both end up where they want to be, that's not bad business in my book. Yeah, and it's going to be really interesting to see how they both do for the rest of the season. I, I do fear for Lacazette a little bit. I hope Wenger hasn't Me lost too. faith in him just yet. But, you know, it's interesting, the transfer talk. And, you know, January to me just seems so disruptive um and yeah. if, you, if there's anyone who's lived and breathed <coughs> through j transfer windows on deadline day is you david you've seen <laughs> it all um so to help us understand you know why i mean i i feel like if you're going to have a january transfer window why not keep the transfer window open all season it's so disruptive look what it's done potentially to to certain club seasons some have been hurt and you know and hindered and some have been enhanced what are your thoughts on the january transfer window and whether it should even exist managers hate it don't they yeah I mean, oh, quite yeah. simply uh, unless, you know, you are, it's, it tends to be more important, I think, traditionally for the bottom clubs who are avoiding relegation uh, and for trying to get into the Premier League now recently in the, in, the, in the last few seasons, we've seen money spent in January by those top championship clubs or the ones who are maybe in playoffs looking for automatic or just outside playoffs trying to, they see the, you know, the, the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow and they think, well, I spend now, I get that and I can get up into the Premier League and that's where the riches are. Um, this window has been slightly different with you know the, the the names that have been moving around or what's changed as well and this goes for both windows really is that premier league clubs are starting to do business with each other before that wasn't the case top premier league clubs i mean i don't mean you know walcott going to everton i mean you know ever uh, arsenal <laughs> selling sanchez listen listen i mean i'm saying i like walcott but it's, it's, it's walcott and it's everton yeah. it's more to do with everton than walcott True. I, I think actually now you start to see even in winter premier league clubs starting to do business with each other and I think that, you know, there's a, in this January window, I think there's a couple of reasons. And one is that it's driven more by players because of the World Cup. Yes. Players want to be playing regularly. And frankly, that's where they consider loans to places they would never dream of going to. Um, hence why, for example, you know, Sturridge was linked with a whole bunch of, of clubs outside the UK and ended up going to West Brom on loan because to get into that national manager's head and, and on their radar. So I think that's one element to which, you know, the, the, the winter window is used when driven by players. But managers, that just makes their life even more difficult. Um, I, I mean, listen, in terms of windows in general, I think what's going to be interesting is how the changes come in for the summer window 
and with with the Premier League having decided to go, is it the ninth? I think it's the ninth of August. Yeah. At five p.m. before the season starts, and and how that shakes everything up. Clearly, the Premier League feel that they want to lead on this, and also that their league is strong enough that even if you know Spanish or German clubs come in after that to try and buy players, because obviously they can't buy players themselves, so their window, you know, Premier League window will have closed, that they can resist those 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 bids from you know the Barcelonas and Real Madrids and Bayern Munichs of this world so I think that actually we'll get a better read on it once summer comes in and we see how it works in England for that transfer window and and, and EFL clubs might well vote the same way as well um, mm. I, I personally listen it's it's it is you know for for Sky for my employer they 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 obviously make a big thing of the transfer window it's one of the real things that attracts viewers to our channel and you know this time it didn't feel like we had to you know really gen up the stories that were there and we were chasing them we were on top of them but it is incredibly stressful for everyone involved i mean i would say that you know my phone works on probably half the battery for most of the month you know it kind of gets down to <laughs> single figures you know when you're kind of sending those late night texts uh, you know to, to managers asking them for this or you're you know checking in with an agent asking him for that and then you realize that you spent you know your, your average phone battery percentage is 20 and you're like i can't deal with this this is doing my head in um so you know i think um it's stressful for everyone involved um but i think the summer might just kind of correct that with mm. the way that the premier league have decided to set their date earlier so do you, how much is it okay the premier league might be happy with that but how is it going to affect the actual teams because you know for someone like arsenal who quite often draw out their transfers and then leave it till the last day of the transfer window. Our last day of the transfer window is going to be completely different to the last yeah. day of every, you know, the rest of Europe's transfer window. So how do you think the team, you know, the teams are going to deal with it and the agents, etc.? Well, listen, I think that actually uh, it's not too disruptive for everyone else because then what's going to happen with those other leagues uh, and the clubs who've had players bought from them by Premier League clubs to say if you're like, I don't know, a Sevilla or or maybe you're a, a, a Wolfsburg or a Schalke or something like that, where, you know, that, that young talent, that brilliant player who Wenger wants to develop has been bought. You then have, uh, what is it, 22 days to replace that player. So, you know, actually, there isn't that mad scramble like there is at the moment on 31st of August. And gosh, add, add to that. The fact that we had games going on that same day as well. Yeah. Of January. I can't, why, that, that, why would they do that? Yeah. Why would they do? I don't understand. The calendar, the calendar is set as the calendar is set. And you have to kind of find gaps to play the games. And remember, you've got four competitions, yeah. you know, for, for most of the top clubs in this country. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you, you, in Spain, in, in, in Germany, I think you only got the one cup. In France, you've got a League Cup as well. But again, you know, that's, that's a very different thing. I think that it's, it's just struggling to find the time in the diary. And yeah. if that happens to be a Tuesday or a Wednesday, then there will be games on that on that date. Yeah. Obviously, in the summer, it doesn't happen this way because it's before the season has started. So I think that will help mm-hmm. everything. Um, and, and listen, agents, if they're used to scrambling on the last day of the window, you give them 22 days, that they'll be they'll be fine. They'll yeah. be fine. <laughs> I, 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 listen, I think, I think it's, it's interesting you've got the two different timelines. Uh, if everyone would start the season, then that, that causes a problem in a way because different seasons start at different dates. Traditionally, Spain is the last one to go and France and Germany tend to be a bit earlier. Mm-hmm. Um, and they, of course, have the winter break. Um, uh, remember, this is after a World Cup as well. So, again, that has a, a knock-on effect because seasons tend to start a week later yeah. when you've had a, a, a World Cup. So, so uh, I think, actually, it's a really useful test of this to see one league, one major league, going for the ninth. And then seeing how that affects the rest of the market. But I don't think it's going to be quite as seismic a, uh, a, a change or disruption as many people were predicting it. Because I think mm. actually the crucial thing that we, none of us have enough of is time. And this gives more people time. You remember the, the August window doesn't start on August the 1st. It starts on July the 1st. So yeah. you've got the best part of, what is it, eight weeks? No, sorry, that's wrong. Uh, six weeks, six and a, six and a half weeks, seven weeks to get that business done. A lot of it is done pre-contact agreement. So a lot of it is done even before July. They just announce it on the 1st of July right. and register the player that day. So so actually, it, it's, it, it makes sense to me. And I think a lot of Premier League, you know, it was, it was a, uh, a decision that went through the entirety of the Premier League clubs. And they all said, yeah, you know, pretty much this is, and there's only, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't unanimous, I don't think, but it was pretty much agreed. And I think that that makes a lot of sense. So I, I think that actually, um, we'll see how this window goes in the summer. And I don't think it's going to be quite as hectic after July, uh, after August 9th. I think that then mm. 
you'll just sort of see people kind of taking stock a little bit and going, okay, so who do we want from Premier League clubs? Or how do we replace the player that we sold to a Premier League club? You know, speaking of the of the summer, can't wait for the summer. Can't wait for the World Cup and um, mm. out. And also, your his intel on the transfer windows, brilliant, right, Sophia? Yeah, Just, uh, so you know, good. I, so good. And and you know, as we head into the World Cup and and as we head into into this kind of exciting time of of the year, our listeners love to know a little bit more about our guests as well. So we're gonna. Mm. We're going to delve into you and your career a little bit now. <laughs> right. And, okay. uh, the, the question that I've been burning to ask you is because you are Colombian and I yeah. think you wear your, your Colombian badge with pride and you, you love your heritage. I'm Greek Absolutely. and Sapphire is, is Jamaican and love it, I'm, love I'm it. bummed. I'm bummed because I only have England to root for in the World Cup this year. <laughs> sure. I don't have, don't have Greece, don't have the USA either. Um, but. Who do you root for? Like, if the fi- let's just say the finals between England and Colombia. Where's your? <laughs> okay, so right, what happened in 1998 was that uh, England played Colombia in the World Cup. It was a Beckham free kick. That's I don't right. know if you remember it. That's yeah. Right. Um, yeah. In- England playing in red. He did the kind of you know like the, the fist pump. You know, yeah, looking all kind of you know um, annoying. And basically, what happened <laughs> after that the next day was that I um, got it totally ripped out of me for the next week. Um, even though England obviously went out in the next round, that's what happens. But I had, uh, you know, now my colours to the mast. My bloodline is Colombian. And if Colombia are at a World Cup, no matter what other teams there are, then I'll support them. If they're not there in England, oh, well, yeah, I'll back England. I've, you know, been brought up in, in this country and raised in this country and lived my whole life in this country. But, you know, this is my, my parents are both mm-hmm. Colombian. It's not like I've got a choice. They're, you know, this is what I was given when I, when I, when I was born. And I'm very proud of that. And, you know, I think, um, Everyone in the last World Cup really had a soft spot for Colombia for, for three reasons. The, the quality of the football, some of the players, James, Cuadrado, um, you know, you had, you had some really nice football played. Mm-hmm. Um, you had the celebrations, so not just from the fans, but from the, from the players themselves, the little dances, you know, that kind of stuff. And, and I think actually that the number of times that I you saw sort of shots of Colombian fans and not just pretty female ones, to be fair, everyone, <laughs> everyone in the crowd, <laughs> with the face paints, with the color, you know, I loved it. I think that it really showed off Colombian culture, um, and it's, and it's love for football. Um, in Brazil, which is obviously, you know, the, the, the spiritual home of South American football in terms of, you know, the Samba style and all the history and all the rest of it, you know, we actually made our mark over there. And, uh, yeah, I'm immensely proud of the Colombian team and very relieved that we got through because our quali- qualification group was, was a nightmare. Apart yeah. from Brazil, we went through and I think, you know, it was a real bun fight towards the end. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I think, you know, I feel kind of just lucky that we've got there and, you know, our group is sort of okay, like yeah. Poland, Senegal, and Japan. Um, and Japan. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I think I think we should be able to get through that uh, in the same way as England should be able to get through against Panama and Tunisia. Um, okay, there's Belgium, but I think you know uh, ultimately <laughs> there's a chance there's a chance we can meet in the knockouts again. And if it happens Ooh. again, I'm prepared to take the ribbing the next day. But this time I think there might be a different result. <laughs> Good lad. So um, you know, love it. like you say, you've got Poland, Senegal, and Japan in your group. Um, who do you think is going to be the hardest team? Who's going to be the hardest team? And do you think you can top that group? Well, uh, yeah, do you think we can top the group? I think the hardest team will actually be Poland. And, uh, and, and, and that's simply just having seen more of them, know a little bit more what, what they're about. Um, I actually kind of went to a couple of their games randomly through a, a different project I did a few years ago. But um, I think just more star names, you know, Lewandowski, Piszczek, Vlaszkowski, just really strong players who play in respected leagues. But what I love about this group is you've got a lot of different kind of styles here. I think that actually Japan will be really interesting because they will play very differently to us uh, and, and, and against us than they will than we will from other opposition. Yeah. And Senegal are maybe like on a par, which is the poorer side. In terms mm-hmm. of style, they're not, they're not that dissimilar. So I think actually, um, we, uh, in theory, we should either top the group or joint top the group because I think that we can probably <laughs> get a draw against Poland and then beat the other two. Right. But Poland might do the same. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, I think I, I sense that it, it, that group is is competitive, but the quality should out there. Um, and, and I would imagine that as long as we don't sort of drop points against one of the, the weaker nations, as I say, Japan is different. I think it's just a tactically, it's, it's just a very, very different situation there. Um, and you've just got to be on your guard. But, but I, I, other than that, I, I, I hope that if, if you think about the players that you've got, and I know a lot of centered around Hamas Rodriguez. We've just had Jerry Mina uh, sign for Barcelona. 
Uh, you've got other players like Luis Muriel, who's Sevilla's record signing uh, a striker. You've got plenty of other talent there. You do. Uh, all the way through the pitch. David Ospina, of course, that you'll know, um, is, is Colombian as well. So yeah, I just kind of feel that, you know, there is quality everywhere. It's just a case of them trying to deliver again in a different continent, which is the, 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 the challenge. If you look at South American teams playing away from the Americas, it doesn't always check out. And that's where you get, you know, the, those, those struggles. And, and I think that, you know, we've got to make sure that they're not sort of phased by the idea of going to Russia. It's a football pitch. It's more or less the same size. It's still 90 minutes. So, you know, you've just got to try yeah. and not let that get to you too much. Yeah. I enjoyed watching Colombia when I covered Copa America here in the United States. Yeah. Um, yeah. You finished third. You were, you know, just a really pretty team, like most of the mm-hmm. South American teams to watch. Speaking of pretty teams... How about those? Uh, how about those owls? <laughs> uh, so yeah, Do you know what? Is it, we, if we're pretty, we've aged pretty badly, and we're not looking that great anymore. And you know, we're not. No one's swiping right on us on Tinder. I think basically what's happened. Right? <laughs> what's happened is okay. So I'll, I'll I'll give you very 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 quick potted history. Uh, change of owner, change of manager, different style, cosmopolitan feel. Bring in loads of players. They gel. A lot of signings in that first season. We get to the playoff final and or lose because Hull are incredibly experienced. They know how to deal with that occasion. And we kind of froze. But the, the nucleus was there and we added to it more quality second season. But then people had worked us out. And, you know, we like to play on transition. We don't mind having the ball, but actually we prefer you to come at us and then we'll quickly move. It's not Leicester, but, you know, we, we, we play better with the ball and we, we, we knit play together well. And players like Bannon and Forestieri and, and Kieran Lee, who's got this great change of, of pace and urgency, those are the players that knitted us together, Gary Hooper as well. But without those players, and when the people start working out how you play and actually just sitting off you and going, go on, then have the ball, you do what you want. Um, people started working us out. We started drawing games we should have been winning. We got to the playoffs again second season, but... Uh, we we just lost our nerve. We we had Huddersfield by by the you know by the by the neck I suppose. Um, I want to say something <laughs> you can else. Say but balls. Probably you can say balls. Okay. On this okay. Show. No, you okay can fine. All right. Okay. I don't want to give honest. you that explicit rating. <laughs> <laughs> um, so and and we and we just lost our nerve um, at home against Huddersfield on penalties. Um, so then third season, the, the I think there's a, an element of fatigue. I think there's an element of oh we didn't do it first season, didn't do it second season. And and the players were hearing the same voice, saying the same things. They'd lost intensity in training. They weren't working that hard. So what's happened is that the results have really fallen away. And we're now, what, 16th, 17th from the table, where we'd been sixth, fourth, you know, the pre- previous two seasons. Yeah. And now we've got a, a new manager in because Carlos has moved to, to Swansea. And I kind of always felt that there was an element to which he sort of knew he would end up at Swansea. They've been interested for a while. Um, and it, it, it kind of, he said that he, he he'd you know, tried to still motivate the players, but they just weren't responding. And there were so many injuries that the players who were second choice knew that they were only in the team because of the injuries. And it was hard to make them feel like first choice. And, uh, and now we've got a, a guy who is called Jos Lukai. He's, he's managed in the, the German leagues a fair bit. He's got a track record of getting teams up from the second Bundesliga up to the, the, the top league. And I guess our, our chairman thinks that this is a useful kind of talent to have because we're looking to do the same, except that the leagues are incredibly different. Um, and he's very pragmatic. He's a disciplinarian. And so we're playing a uh, different formation, very different football. We're not scoring, but we're, we're conceding less. So, you know, the, the days of sort of flowing football and, you know, a packed out Hillsborough and, you know, beating Arsenal 3-0 in the League Cup a couple of seasons ago. Oh. Sorry, I had to just throw that one in. Excuse me. <laughs> uh, what, what about when we beat you gone. twice? Let's not forget uh, that. In yeah, one season. I, yeah. Listen, it still yeah. it's, it still hurts me. I, I still think of ninety two, ninety three, and it and it still hurts me. But um, but listen, you know, I th- and and also on that, I think on that on that day, didn't you lose Walcott very early, and maybe Iwobi or someone I can't remember. Like you, you had two injuries in the space of the first fifteen twenty minutes. Yeah. Um, and bizarrely, I was on holiday in like Southeast Asia, and I I got to the hotel lobby, and it was like uh, my time. It was like something like three or four in the morning, yeah. and I woke up. Uh, I went to bed, woke up in time to watch the pre-match and watched it uh, on the hotel sort of like computers. I managed to find a stream and watch it. And um, and then, you know, uh, it was incredible performance. But I thought we were lucky for that reason of the injuries that you suffered. And then as the game finished and the post-match and I just finished, the sun just rose. And I'm there. And that's not my new day. Perfect. On my holiday. And I'm like, oh, life is perfect. Yeah, sadly, things have changed. And, you know, good old life has come and kicked me back in the backside and uh, say, no, that's all right. You're 17th in the championship. You know, you know, you can wake up now. So, 
look yeah. i think it's um it's 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 a it's a real reality check because we thought we were we were you know one of the favorites to go up this season mm. it just hasn't worked that way i think i you know I think it's not just to do with the style and the pretty football, but, you know, expectations in the championship. You know, there are, there are clubs it's who are spending lots of money. It's yeah, a it's hugely tough. tough division, yeah. Sophie. I mean, like, you know, yeah. look at Wolves. They spend a hell of a lot of money. They are certs to go up. That's fine. But, you know, the, the number of teams that are sort of big name teams that are below that, you know, the likes of your Villas, your Derbys, yeah. Middlesbrough, um, Norwich, Reading struggling like us, you know, Leeds have just sat, sat their manager. Yeah. There are some big, big names in the championship that haven't managed to to get back up or if they come down or, you know, look at Hull, look at Sunderland. Yeah. So I think, you know, it's a very, very tough division. And if you don't do it in that space of that two years to three years, you have to freshen up the squad. Otherwise you do get that sort of fatigue coming in and you, you know, the, the pressure and the people relax and they get tired of the same voice. Um, so we need to freshen up. We've at least done it with a manager and we'll see. We didn't do anything really in January in terms of signings and one, one or two coming in. And then we'll see in the summer and see if we go again. But I think what I find difficult is the way that fans sometimes react. And again, this is Twitter. And they just slag off the club. Well, why aren't we spending this? Why aren't we doing this? Why aren't we winning that game? Why aren't we playing so rubbish? It's like, hang on a minute. Where were we five years ago or six years ago? We were in League One. So, you know, yeah, have just a little that. bit of perspective here. The change of fortunes leads to a change in expectation and a loss of perspective. And, you know, I just kind of feel that that, that, you know, it doesn't help anyone. It doesn't help the players. It doesn't help the manager. The, the pressure increases um, and, and the understanding just ebbs away. Um, and it's, it's, you know, the ones who get it right, are the ones who strategize and plan it maybe over two or three seasons and they build and build and build and then they go up and then they maintain it when they get up there. Um, so I think that, you know, we, we, we need to just have another little look now and, and see how we can start that process again. So going from one tough division to a uh, not so tough division, as people say, because they believe that only... If it's not Real Madrid, it's Barcelona. <laughs> that can uh, win it. Don't you start. Don't you start. <laughs> okay, so um, people go on about um, which league is better and people say, oh, um, the Premier League is better than La Liga. You follow both and also ge- mm. the German, the Bundesliga. Um, which one would you pick or can you not? Um, which is more exciting to well, you? Is, that, you is, know is what, it quality? You know what's interesting? I think there are different things, and I promise you I'm not sitting on the fence here, okay. but this is my honest reading. Oh, there are different go. things that... <laughs> <laughs> hear me out now. Come on, Sophia, hear me out. Okay. So, <laughs> there are different things here that I think count in different leagues. Look, you know, yes, the Premier League is incredibly competitive. How can you have Bournemouth beating Chelsea 3-0 away at Stamford Bridge? How can you have Burnley beating Chelsea 3-2 away at Stamford Bridge on the opening day of the season? I'm not just having a go at Chelsea. Liverpool have had the odd shocking result. Arsenal, we've discussed. I think that actually you've got runaway leaders in each of the of the leagues, but the relegation battle in the Premier League is perhaps the most compelling narrative that there is right now because 100%. you know every single match day it changes and it, and you know who is gonna you know it's the whole bottom of the bottom half of the table that are involved. Pretty much everyone up to you know Everton, I think, uh, could, could well be dragged in. For Spain, you've got Barcelona nine points clear of Atletico, who are nine points clear of Valencia, and then you've got Real Madrid. And I think that actually one of the things is that it's just all about Barcelona and Madrid. Um, Atletico just do what Atletico do under Simeone, which is just not lose many games and generally win by narrow score lines. And Valencia have been a revelation in terms of the way they've That's my been able to come team. back this season. Uh, mine too. Mine oh, too. Um, nice. And, and listen, we, we've, yeah, I mean, listen, we, we started like a train and now I think we're feeling the intensity of the yeah, season. Yeah. Um, we've got a couple of race semi-final second leg on Thursday against Barca which basically is the season now I mean that and finishing top four but in terms of the title race it's gone we're 18 points off Barcelona yeah Um, I I, I kind of feel that you know yes Barcelona are all conquering but if you look into the football that they've been playing first sort of I don't know 15 games they weren't pulling up trees it was very effective it was Mm -hmm. 4-4-2 you know they'd lost Neymar they'd had a lot of things to deal with with that whole situation getting in Dembele then he gets injured and what well, everyone thought that thing. Madrid were going to were going to run away with it after you know they they Completely. won, and so everybody's really shocked at them as well. So well, well they're having the, a double is... a double winning season hangover for sure. Madrid are, are yeah, suffering yeah. from last year's success, aren't they? I, I think the, the the Super Cup win in August, where they beat Barcelona five one over two legs, yeah. was possibly the worst thing that could have happened to them. Agreed, because it gave them this a- arrogance and overconfidence that everything was fine. What Madrid uh, arrogant, you know, really? 
<laughs> <laughs> but you know what though i do feel for zinedine sudan because i don't think it's all his fault everyone's sort of saying oh he's, he's a rubbish coach but remember in the madrid dressing room it's not the same as any other dressing room it's not no. like managing Burton albion you've got <laughs> egos there to deal with you know you've got other situations in terms of the politics you know florentino perez a very 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 demanding fan base especially at the Bernabeu, where they've suffered some 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 big sort of bad results you know mm-hmm. losing one nil at home to raul betis uh, losing one nil in the copper to leganes at oh, the i know Bernabeu. i mean that you know, was that, embarrassing that, that was that was appalling Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, you know, this is a, you know, uh, Zidane has got credit in the bank because he's won La Liga and he's won two Champions Leagues on the bounce, which has never been done before. So I think that he should be allowed to see out the season. And of course, everything now rests on PSG first leg on Valentine's Day at home. Who are, you, pick- who are you picking? Who are you picking? Right now, it's got to be PSG. Right, right now, it's got to be PSG because simply the way that Madrid are, there's just this real funk. There's this real kind of um, uncertainty. There's no rhythm. The BBC are back. And I think that Zidane is just praying that they recover some of the form that they had last season just with those three. It's a little bit like what Barca did under Luis Enrique last season, that basically the, the, the plan was get it to the front three. Who cares about the midfield? It changed every, it changed every week anyway. Um, Sometimes he'd rest Iniesta, sometimes he'd rest Rakitic, sometimes he'd play Andre Gomez, sometimes he'd rest Busquets. So, you know, there was very little consistency. I think he played like something like 17 or 18 different midfield for, you know, uh, lineups wow. throughout the season. Wow. You know, that madness, madness. And so <laughs> actually under Guardiola, you just knew, you just absolutely knew knew what the and, and under Valverde you know as well what this last line is going to be but lineup, basically yeah. it meant that, that that didn't matter it was much more direct get it up to the front three let them sort it no confidence in the rest of the squad look what's happening in Madrid now the BBC are going to be carrying all the responsibility uh, Kroos, Modric, Casemiro are not clicking in the same way as they did last season and um, actually the, the players that he's got behind that in the squad one who I really like Danny Ceballos who they signed from Real Betis they brought back Marcus Llorente they signed Teo Hernandez from Atletico None of these are figuring. Mm. So, you know, there's just no conf- there's just no confidence. And and when Real Madrid win, they don't necessarily win well, but it's because they've got this aura that they will get there. The number of times that they went behind and managed to, to come back and, 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 and score to either equalise or win the game last season, you know, God was, was numerous and, mm. and I think that they've really lost that quality. They've yeah. lost the hunger because I think that's what the Supercopper did, is they yep. thought that it would be a cakewalk. Yeah. And, yeah. and then they, you know, the, 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 the signings they've brought in haven't added anything, or Zidane hasn't had the faith in them to put them in to let them add anything. You so know, I think this is why, you know, if it's about Barcelona and Real Madrid, well, fair enough, we've got some decent decent stories there, but there's way more to it. Way more. There, to is, it, there is way more to it, and and someone who, who we completely miss, um, and we're hoping that you can identify a replacement for us from La Liga. Santi Cazola, who I know that oh, you admire man. as a player as well, and, you know, it's just yeah. really sad to see how things have um, kind of ended ended up for him. Yeah. Um, yeah. he's, a, he's a gem and we've never ever replaced him nope. your thoughts your thoughts mm. on him but then also your thoughts on wh- who's the next Santi coming out of Spain that Arsenal mm. should be keeping their eye on okay there's a few there's a few and some are, extent, uh, uh, are actually uh, already established and some are, are just coming through uh, I know the, the, the journalist who did the, the marker story on Santi where he saw those incredible pictures of his Achilles and his ankle it was um, awful I don't know if you, it was, yeah, horrendous, wasn't it? Because he had his, his uh, I think it was his daughter's name tattooed. From the, and he had to get the skin graft, yeah. Right, right. You remember this fight? It was, it was horrendous. Oh. And, you know, and, and I remember actually on the day of that story coming out, Sky Sports News obviously heard about it, wanted to run the pictures. I speak to the, the journo, a friend of mine, Lorena, who, who was there doing the filming with Santi. Um, and, uh, I mean, what, what a humble guy, by the way. And, you know, oh. how close he was to just jacking mm-hmm. it all in. Um, and, and he, yeah, I mean, he really is kind of the forgotten man. He could be such a, a real linchpin. Oh, we have, a, we, he have really a, is. we have a forgotten him. Arsenal fans miss him big time. No. Yeah. I, but, I so there, are some, there are some options, though. Um, there's a, there's a, a very good kid called Fabian at Real Betis who is, you know, just really coming out now. He's not a, a holder, but he's kind of a bit of an all-action midfielder. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that actually mm. he's probably a little bit more active than Santi, who will probably sit a bit deeper. Yeah. But he's got that real awareness as a footballer. Um, he's only, I think he's 21. Nice. So he's raw. But, you know, he he, he made, uh, I think, um, his first, uh, the, the better Seville derby, as you guys all know, is a huge derby in Spain. It's about class, it's about politics. Yeah. It's a real rivalry. These are two big clubs. It's not like you've got 
one big club and one small club, like say Barcelona and Espanyol are obviously different sizes of clubs in the same city, whereas in Seville, Sevilla and Betis are, are pretty much on a par. Yeah. And, and Seville were supposedly more middle class and Betis were more sort of, you know, the, the worker and the, the proletariat of the, of the city. And it's a huge derby, which Betis won 5-3 at Ooh. Sevilla and Fabian scored the first goal. Oh, uh, yeah, I've seen it. He, he's he's a pretty player. Yeah, he's, he's, good. Has he he's been, good. He's been mentioned for us, hasn't he? He was mentioned a little bit in January. It would not surprise it, me in the slightest. Um, yeah. he, he is, he's that sort of player that I think could, could easily move very quickly, but I don't think it's right for him to move yet. I, I personally think he needs to just bed in and, and spend a season, two seasons in La Liga and, and better for his team. So why would he move so quickly? Yeah. I think, you know, he, he's, he is a Betico himself. So let, let him come and enjoy playing for his, for his boyhood club, the club that he loves. And then, you know, as and when things really start progressing and he needs to progress because he's progressing quicker than the club is progressing, then, yeah, then that's when other other teams uh, come into play uh, abroad particularly. I think there were a few other ones. Um, the one player who I really love at, um, at Villarreal is Manu Trigueros. So I reckon he's the sort of player who does his work very, very diligently, but at every yards. And he can pick that forward pass that maybe like a Luka Modric can. I kind right. of see him in a very similar mold to Luka, but, um, you know, he, he actually plays a little bit flatter. He plays more. It's a VRL play 4-3-1-2. So they've got um, a, uh, a player who's a proper holding midfielder in Rodri. And then they've got Trigueros, who's sort of allowed a little bit of license to roam, but he knits play together. And then every so often he plays that real incisive pass. So it's kind of the tempo setter. And I think that Trigueros, mm. I, can, I can imagine, would be... Uh, he, he, listen, I don't think he's a complete Cazorla, you know, he's not, he's not identical, but I think he's got certain qualities, certainly in terms of ball retention and, and finding those incisive passes rather than just keeping possession for possession's sake that I think, you know, a uh, uh, really, you know, it's an intelligent footballer. Uh, he's one of my favourites. He, he made it into my sort of La Liga team of the year last season ahead of some bigger names like uh, wow. Yaran Indy, who used to be at Real Madrid, um, or I even didn't have Isco in there. Because oh, I just wow. thought there other, other players that I felt in the formation that I had that I think were, did, had more of an impact for their team than, than, other, than other players who were perhaps uh, a little bit more well-known. So, Excellent. Yeah, Write that one down, two. Sophia. Yeah. Write those down. Write those down. <laughs> brilliant, stuff, brilliant stuff from David Garrido here from Sky Sports. Now, um, we've got the serious stuff out of the way, so we're going to get you out on a little bit of fun stuff, Okay. Okay. So you've agreed to uh, play our quick fire round. And by the way, Let's we're going to have to have David back um, when the summer transfer window Definitely. kicks in. Sure. You promised to come back because we can be in, can for in. hours. Brilliant. OK, so our quick fire round it is exactly what it is. We ask you some really quick fire questions and you just give us your one word or two word answers. It starts okay. on my cowbell. Are you ready? <laughs> right. OK. Here we go. OK. La Liga or Premier League? La Liga. Sorry, guys. Oh, Messi or Ronaldo? Messi. Every day of the week. Oh, Barcelona or Real Madrid? Simply because of numbers of titles, 33 leagues, 12 European Cups, Real Madrid. Nice. <laughs> Love the explanations. Commentate on Sheffield Wednesday winning goal to get in the Premier League or England versus Colombia winning goal to snag the World Cup. Can I do a hybrid? How about no, that? No, you can't do a hybrid. <laughs> oh, oh, man. <laughs> See, that would be my dream, right? A Colombian player scoring for, for Wednesday to, to get to the Premier League. Okay, I'll go Oh, Wednesday. there you go. <laughs> okay, that's The ball's fine. on the left-hand side with Adam Reach. Can he get past the defender this time? He's been tormenting him all afternoon. Gets to the byline, swings him across. You're in Rose! Oh, Rose! Lee to the Premier League. And that is surely the goal that takes Wednesday back up to the promised land. Oh, my God. That's absolutely fantastic. How do you follow that up? I don't know. But here we go. Lewis Hamilton or Nigel Mansell? Oh, God. Tough one. Um, on Just on a moustache level, Nigel Mansell. <laughs> oh <my. laughs> um, backpack through Asia or South America? Oh, come on. Next question. All right. Blur or Oasis? Blur. Yeah, I love Blur. It was my first band that I ever got into. Oh, wow. Good to know. Seen them live loads of times. Brilliant band. Brilliant band. Um, win a Grammy or an Oscar? Oh, uh, an Oscar? Want to do a big speech? Hold the trophy. <laughs> Ketchup or mustard? Uh, mustard. Mustard, but not English. That's too hot. Maybe sort of a nice Dijonese with whole grain in it. Oh, yes. Oh, you, you see, you used that, to be working class that, and now you're not. that sound middle class enough for you? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Star Wars or Star Trek? Neither. 
God, no. Don't oh. have any time for that kind of nonsense. Oh, no. See, oh, and, and I liked you. Are we, are we falling then. out now? So We're far? falling out. She's a sci-fi geek. She's are a you, geek. Have you deleted me on Facebook? No. <laughs> <laughs> and Jamie Rendell for Jamie Carragher. Oh. Well, do you know what? Can I quickly explain this one? I'm going to go Redknapp because, because on deadline day uh, in the summer, I asked Redknapp, uh, sorry, I asked Carragher, uh, was Oxlade Chamberlain more of a loss for Arsenal, more of a gain for Liverpool? And his reply was, eh, that's a good question coming from you. <laughs> so for that reason, I'm going Redknapp. Oh my God, <laughs> By the way, I mean, I think it's a fair <laughs> argument, right? I, I think it's a fair argument. Yes. Oh, that's typical, typical Cara. David, yeah, that was Cara. absolutely, <laughs> that was absolutely brilliant. We keep arguing that my, my Scouse accent's absolute rubbish. <laughs> it's probably better than mine. <laughs> no, no, apparently not. Wow. Thanks so much for joining us on the show today. Um, you've been brilliant. It's Fantastic. been so much fun. No problem. Listen, it's been a lot of fun for me too. Listen, all the best. Uh, you know, I think this is a, a really fantastic thing to have there, you know, for people to listen to week by week. And uh, I'll happily join your, the, your growing family and I'll come back whenever you need. Brilliant. Lovely. Thanks, well, thank David. Thank you so much for coming on. It's been so much fun. Likewise, Sophia. Speak to you soon, guys. Bye. Take care. Bye. So there's been a lot going on in social media land. Um, uh, first of all, uh, we saw Rihanna attending the Arsenal Everton game and um, somebody gave her a shirt and she said, she actually said, I'm a gooner. Whether she knew what that actually <laughs> means. Is, is, is did she your, sing it? She did, did she sing it? She didn't sing no. it. She just said it in a like Virgin accent, but it was pretty cool. It was pretty cool. All the players made sure that they got videos with her, pictures with her. Mesa actually tweeted, um, thank, she's brought him luck again because she was there for when he won the World Cup and now she yeah, was there cute. for the win against Evan, which, yeah, I thought that was really cute too. So no, we seem to have all the stars that, um, are, who loved, love the Arsenal. Sadly, one of the stars that, well, I don't actually love is Piers Morgan, if you can call him that. And I was a bit disappointed to see him trying to give Trump one of our shirts. He didn't even have the decency to give him a new one. It was like last year's season one, but <laughs> honestly. Did he sign it? Was it signed by Piers? Oh, well, he didn't sign it, but he had, he, he had um, five. Trump or what? Uh, oh, it was just, it was embarrassing. Let's just say it was embarrassing. So moving on from that. Um, let's uh, talk about the Arsenal ladies who beat Yeovil Town 3 0 in the FA yes. Cup. Yeah, so yes, so at least one, at least one of the teams is still going in it. <laughs> and um, they did the draw on Monday morning for the fifth round, and um, we got the Millwall Lionesses in the next round, who actually we beat earlier this season in the Continental Tires Cup. We, we beat them um, away from home five two. So hopefully. We can progress and beat them again, and this time at least we're at home. They're so, so that, good. Oh, they're, they're so good, aren't yeah. they? We're they're, not as great as we used to be, but you know what? I, I, did, I did like um, one of the. I can't remember which uh, Arsenal lady tweeted, but she when um, they were saying, "Oh, City are going for the first um, for the four trophies in the season." One of the Arsenal ladies actually tweeted, um, "I seem to remember one team's already done that in this country," <laughs> which I thought was brilliant. <laughs> That's good stuff. <laughs> it was very yes. good stuff. And um, finally, I know that we're talking football, soccer, but um, I also want to talk American football because uh, uh, the Philadelphia Eagles actually defied the odds to be yep. the New England Patriots and won the yep. Super Bowl. And it just so happens that we've got an Arsenal fan, Jay or Jay, also known as J Train, um, and he's been getting congratulations from from Arsenal, the official Arsenal account, which tweeted a video of him when he was at the Emirates uh, last season, and also um, Aubameyang. This is what I love about you know so when certain players join us straight away and just. Uh, feeling it and yeah. he, he was like the first player he's already tweeted congratulations to um j train and he did like a little smiley face and a fist bump it was great and you know i, I don't know I, you know some of his fans have 
we're not sure whether players actually care sometimes, but I just like the way that Barry Yang's going about things. He's, you know, he's tw- he tweets all the players. He's like, he's always putting out his little pictures and he, he genuinely seems happy to be here. And I just hope it continues. I, I like I tweeted earlier in, in, in the week, I'm, I'm loving the Arsenal loving and I hope it continues on the pitch. And, and that was the feeling I got at the Everton game. It's mm-hmm. like, you know, the Mesa, Obama Yang, um, Nikitari trio. It just worked. It was so cohesive and, and it's, you, it looks like there's a genuine friendship there. And yes. I'm, you know, and, you know, our beloved Seema tweeted that, you know, the bad seed's gone. Maybe that's why <laughs> we won Well, Ozil's one. Instagram, right, it was really telling, wasn't it, yes. after the game where he said for, for – for a, I, I feel like now I have confidence going forward. It was something along those lines. Yeah. And I thought that was really, you know, really kind of telling really in terms telling. Of, of how people are feeling and he's feeling. And you're right. There was an immediate understanding. They didn't have to, you know, play four or five games together no, to gel. No. Granted, it was against a very, very poor oh, Everton team. Side, yeah. But I, I do feel like they, there is that genuine kind of camaraderie there. And, yeah. um, we haven't seen that in a really long time. And but. I don't think you can fake that. I mean, you could try no. to, but I think it's, it, it properly shows, doesn't it? And, and I just hope it continues. That's all I'm hoping. We just sort out the defense and, and sort out our away form. Um, cause that's the thing speaking of away from, but anyway, we'll get onto the North London yeah, derby. We'll get but... into that. <laughs> let's, uh, let's, uh, it's a good social media bit there, Sophia. Thanks very much for that. And, uh, why don't we play a little snog, marry your boy? Do you want to do that, eh? Should <laughs> yeah, we squeeze that go. in before let's we talk about it. the North London derby? <laughs> right. Um, in honor of the January transfer window, we have Mkhitaryan, Obama Yang, and Mavrobanos. Mavrobanos. <laughs> <laughs> so, babe, who are you taking? Who are you dumping? Who are you keeping? Who are you marrying? Okay, so I'm going to snog Mkhitaryan uh, just to say thanks for that wonderful debut, the man of the match debut for me, even though Ramsey scored the hat-trick the hat-trick of assists that Mkhitaryan provided and just his general work rate and stuff. I've got to give him a snog to say thank you. And <laughs> <laughs> it'll be a long snog of, but there you go. And um, I'm afraid I'm going to have to avoid a Bamiyan because even though he's a great player, those teeth, I, just, I think I just get lost in them. They are just huge. He smiles and like, it's like the moon. <laughs> so I'm afraid I'm bless going to avoid him. him bless him but I still love you Aubameyang and I'm going to marry Mavropanos now I know oh Mavropanos now I know he's young and <laughs> people might think but but hey I'm 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 not scared to be a cougar. What's wrong with that? I've done it before. Hey, I'll do it again. And I, I, can, I can mould him. I can teach him. And for the rest of his life, I mean, what's not what's not to love? <laughs> Look at you, cougar. And then if you do get married and have babies, you'll be a milf. Oh, th- right? There you go. There you go. And then, that, like, am and I then, allowed to say that? And then the we, yeah, of course you're oh, allowed okay. to say that. Right. And also, um, and then we'll both have like Greek insiders. <laughs> Oh, oh, right. Yes, moving on. Um, right, fine. I will pick Mkhitaryan to snog. Um, you know, Armenians and Greeks, they get on really well, you know. Oh, we kind of like, yeah, yeah, una fata, una rata kind of thing. And our, we, we like the same food as well. So I feel like me and Mickey, you know, we'll get on like a house on fire. And then, of course, you have Mavrobanos. How can I not marry Mavrobanos? Well, I mean, he's a go. Greek boy. We could talk Greek all day. I could say to him, Yasu pedagi mutikanis telis nasukano kati nafaz. What you know, the and hell then does that mean? I said, hello, sweetheart. You know, would would you like me to make you something to eat? Nice. You know, that, yes, yes. And then Obama Yang, I'm going to avoid uh, because, you know, I, for the same, similar reasons to you, and um, I just don't feel him in that way the way I do the other two. That's cool. as fair and as honest I can be. Good and even you. though the girls, even though the girls aren't on the show today, <laughs> here is what Amanda had to say about snog, marry, avoid. Hi, girls. So sorry I can't be with you today. 
But yeah, I still want to do Snog, Marry, Avoid. So out of my choices for Snog, Marry, Avoid, I'm going to avoid <laughs> Mavropanos. He's far too young for me. I'd probably scare him to death and I'd want him to stay at Arsenal. I'm going to marry Alba Myang. Oh, have I said it right? Um, so I can practice his name every night. And I'm definitely going to snog Mkhitaryan because he can just assist me in every way possible. Okay, girls, see you soon. Bye. Oh, my God. Uh, <laughs> Sophia, do you think Amanda is ever going to pronounce Obama Yang's who, name who is correctly? Al who is Albanga? Oh, I don't even know. I can't even say it wrong. I don't understand. How, <laughs> she, how can you not? How is difficult is it to say Obama Yang? Obama Yang. Amanda, it's Obama Yang. Not Albama Yang. Not Obama Yang. Obama Yang. Easy. By the way. By the way, I mean, someone mentioned to her on Twitter the other day, just call him Pierre. I mean, so much easier for oh, you. But, oh, Pete. Oh, Pete. Because yeah, he even puts him, he, he hashtags P-E-A, doesn't he? So oh, just, gosh. Oh, Pete. Yeah, Pete, easy. And she called him Uber the other day. Oh, I nearly lost my mess. shit. On and then she had a go at me yesterday for pronouncing Cockerland's name wrong. Oh, please. Oh, no, I'm like, she can't even. She can't yeah. even. But anyway, she didn't, she didn't go for the Greek boy, did she? Eh? No, I know she's wrong. She's a wrong one. Yeah. It's Amanda. Anyway. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> we love you, Amanda. We love you too, Seema. Right. Um, North London derby. Oh, it's a massive we game. Do we, we do. We, I know we're, um, it's, you know, bear with us, guys. It's been an epic show. Uh, we do have to talk about the North London derby, of course. Wembley's like our second home. Why can we play there so well? What is it about that stadium, Sophia? And, what do you see? What does your crystal football tell you about this weekend's game? Okay, so we normally up our game when we play at Wembley. Don't know why, we just do. I don't know, maybe it's, you know, when they say that, you know, English English people can't stand Wembley, but foreign players absolutely love it. For them, it's historical. And I guess maybe because we've got so many foreign players in the team, they just love playing there. But this is different. It's... It's Wembley, but it's not Wembley. Um, it's the noisy neighbours. I'm worried about this game. Um, mm. it just, our away rep, we've only won three times away from home, and that's at Palace, Burnley, which was a look, it was right at the death, and Everton, who were poor. Um, we've not got a great record against teams in the top six. I'm worried. The plus side is that, you know, with the new boys, maybe it's given us a new lease of life. Um, I'm going to, so with all that said. <laughs> I was going to say, you sound like you need a hug. I mean, I, I, do, I, I do. give you a vir virtual hug. <laughs> <laughs> with all that said, I'm going for a 2-2 draw. Listen, that game at the weekend must have taken a lot out of Spurs, the Liverpool game. Yeah. It was insane, it right? Was. Emotionally, mentally, physically, that was quite the match and a pff, unbelievable finish to that match as well. Now, I agree with you. Our away form has been horrific. And if we were going to White Hart Lane, I think I'd be much more worried about this game than, um, than I am us going to Wembley because – I don't know what it is. Wenger loves playing there. He's, it's actually a place that he feels super at home. Um, I feel like Obama Yang and Mkhitaryan are going to be super excited about playing at Wembley, especially Obama Yang, because, um, I don't think he's played there as much as Mkhitaryan has over the last, um, couple of seasons. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and I feel like our front three are as good as Tottenham's, if not a little bit better. Right. Dare I say that? No, I um, think so. I think you're right. And our right. defence without Monreal is going to worry me. If the if if it comes to be, do we know yet? Is he going to be fit? He, he was still, sick, right? He yeah, just he had a bug sick. or something. It was a bug. Okay. So hopefully they've given him enough antibiotics and drugs to, <laughs> to sort him out. Shits? Did he have the shits or something? Oh, I, don't, I thought I thought it was like a cold thing, but you know they never explain, do they? They just say he's ill. But hopefully uh, he, because uh, uh. I think he's so integral to how well we play. I think he's I so he's so underrated, and you know, so he, he, 
I'm just worried. Sophia, Sophia, would you feel even more worried if Espina was going to be in goal versus Peter uh, Peter Cech this this weekend? I think he's going to be fine too, but... No, I wouldn't actually. I think they're on the same yeah. level now. I yeah. think I'm yeah. so rem- I remember when when we interviewed Gary Lineker and one of the questions I said to Gary was I'm not impressed with Czech. I haven't been all season. Yeah. I think he's get his his reactions are too slow. He's coming out. He's too slow. He hasn't saved the pen for us. And now, don't get me wrong. I know the advantage is with the attacker when it's a penalty, but not to have saved one. No, even because. No. What are the um, odds? I mean, even if he stood still once, he'd save one. And it just yeah, even me. even Carrius did that yesterday. Yeah. Just stood still, still and saved it. Yeah. I know. And I, know. I and I and I do think I think they're on the same level now. I it, it, I actually wouldn't mind Ospina getting a run. And now now I know that's controversial, but I do. But I just think Czech is just his his head's not there. You know, as as wonderful as he's been for us, he's also, you know... Um, a liability. Had, had, yeah, he's not had some good moments this season. Aspina's height worries me a little bit, but yeah. he's a great shot stopper. Yeah. Um, and I, I wouldn't feel... I think he'd rise to the occasion, um, especially playing playing at Wembley. Um, okay, so here's what Uber Mama Yang <laughs> has to say about the North London derby. <laughs> Hello, prediction time. So I predicted 2-1 against um, Everton. I was only three goals out. Let's hope I'm not three goals out this time, eh? Um, 2-2. I'm praying for a draw. I, I honestly can't call this game. It could go either way. If we turn up, we could win it. And if we don't, we're going to get hammered. So I'm just playing safe. I really don't know. Let's go for 2 all. And let's just hope that we beat them. Oh, man. So I guess for me, I think it's going to be, I think it might be 3-3. I think I'm just going to stick with that. Look forward to discussing the game with the girls next week. It's been an epic show, Sophia. It's been Um, brilliant. It's been good stuff. Thanks again to David Garrido from Sky Sports for joining us. He was fabulous absolutely awesome and remember wherever you are wherever you may be be safe and amanda what do you say always arsenal hey i'm jules breach hi i'm adrian charles hi i'm jason candy hey my name's lee dixon i'm alan smith hi i'm ryan giggs hello i'm matt lucas hi i'm andrew from Ars blog i'm gary lineker and you're listening to highbury and heels Oh, 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 oh,